We're putting together a Fabricator Pro for a customer, and he ordered one with a, with a laser. We already worked on the mounts in a previous video. I think that was vlog number one. And now we have to fabricate this dust shoe portion here. The dust shoe is a half inch plexiglass, and it has a groove around the perimeter of the dust shoe that accepts a, a strip brush. The dust shoe assembly connects to a high wind spec type of a rail system as the rail and the and the bearing block here and the dust shoe is meant to sort of glide on top of the surface of the workpiece allowing the, uh, the the vacuum to maintain a good amount of vacuum pressure within this section here as it glides on the surface and the spindle moves up and down while this is gliding and you can see that as a part of some of the videos that we, we show the machine in action. So let's check out uh, the process and how we fabricate this particular part. This is what the actual part looks like after complete fabrication, uh, fabricating it from the CNC machine, cleaning it up, and gluing in the strip brush. Okay, here we uh, place the material in the machine, and now we are trying to do the uh, zero the C-axis at this point, as well as the X and Y, at, you know at the same time so here I'm, I'm basically just uh turning the nut on the spindle just to make sure it runs free before it actually touches the the material here we're working with a half inch acrylic i believe it's a four by eight sheet but which is basically using uh some of the material that is a uh, portion that has been already cut so we're just trying to maximize our material so we're trying to zero the machine right at the very end of the last cut that's it so we did uh the c-axis and now we're gonna go back to to do the x and y so we're trying to zero the machine right at the very end of the last cut and we're verifying that make you know that the, the whole file is going to be cut on material not away from it we verify that through the visual portion of mark 3 you can actually visualize where the file is going to be cut through within the x and y within the x and y position verifying that we should be able to start cutting here we are um doing uh two i believe it's uh three eighths diameter holes for the screws to secure the L bracket to the machine and attach it to the place glass. The brush typically glides over the surface where the spindle moves up and down but in this case it's not. Uh, and the reason the reason why is the brush is not going up and down as it should is because the, the vacuum hose actually got attached to the top bracket on the machine to the point that it's not being able to run freely at, that, at this point. Um, so somehow it got attached or stuck on one position on the very top so the brush is essentially stuck on one place so here we're cutting uh, the inside diameter of those two holes one for the spindle and one for the vacuum uh, hose and we're doing two passes doing a roughing pass and a finishing pass as well just to be able to get the uh, closest to the to the geometry of uh, the diameter of the of the fitting for the vacuum hose for that to be able to fit relatively snug on this portion we're doing the pocketing for the brush strip so I, I believe we're going up to a quarter inch depth notice how there is a difference in appearance with the chips that are being left behind on an initial pass there really isn't any place for chips to go and with acrylic the chips get sticky so they stick to the edges this is common with thermoplastics uh, the packeting is about it's a little it's about 0.28 I believe and that width has to, we have to make sure that the strip brush can fit into that, that groove. Correct. Times the brush is not uniform, you'll be able to see on the next, uh, in the next part of the video when we are attaching the brush to the, to the acrylic. Right here, we're just uh, we're finally doing the profile of the entire piece. And as you can see, we stay fairly close to where the previous cut uh, was made. And, and we try to emphasize that at all times because obviously material is quite expensive. So you'll see in the, in the video, the machine stopped abruptly at one section of the profile. It's noticeable that you can see a lot of the chips hanging on the edge of that profile. And that's probably gumming up, maybe, I don't know. So what do you think, what do you think happened there where it actually stopped and it sort of had that vibration? I think the depth of the cut had a lot to do into it because he was removing too much material. Was it going too slow? No, I don't think the the the, the IPM uh, inches per minute. The inches per minute on the motors, I think, was correct. I think it was the depth of the of the cut. 
that it was, if anything, was too too slow. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. I think if you go faster, it's going to be less heat to cause any of that gumming up. So mm -hmm. we weren't able to get through the entire piece, obviously, because it, it didn't uh, cut the profile correctly. So we're going to have to start a new one. And we made adjustments. Yeah, we uh, made adjustments on the on the depth port pass. So we increased the amount of passes. So you're actually decreasing the depth per pass to create more passes. Correct. But you're also increasing the speed, right? No, I left the uh, actually left the speed the same, the inches per minute. The chips don't seem to be evacuated until the full depth has been achieved. Mm -hmm. And you know, a little bit of cleanup. The end mill does a tiny bit of cleanup on that on that edge on that final pass. We're keeping the spindle speed at what, 24,000 or 18,000? 18,000 18,000. And that, that's one of the reasons why you want to go as fast as possible because 18,000 is really fast RPM for cutting materials that can melt and cause high friction. I've noticed that aluminum is very similar to acrylic. Obviously acrylic is very, it's like, it look, it's a lot easier to machine acrylic, but you still have to consider the melting point. Aluminum has a melting point as well, and if you run the spindle or the end mill through aluminum at a high RPM and a slow feed rate, you're going to gum up the edges of the aluminum. And you will also leave chips inside of the end mill, causing the end mill to not cut properly and not evacuate the chips. So you have this perpetual problem, or a problem perpetuating itself, making it harder and harder for it to, to mill, and then you have eventually a, an end mill just full of chips. So we use the same holding tabs. I'm cool. just gonna yeah. cut it out with, uh, with our multi-tool. Depending on the diameter of the, of the, of the circle, I'll find out the two holding tabs is just enough. Is there like a maximum number of holding tabs you'd use for a larger object? Like, would four be the maximum, or would like a hundred be a maximum? I don't think it's. Uh, it, it depends on the uh, the uh, size of your holding tabs, because it could, it could also play into the role of the the hole. Or it also depends on the geometry of the part itself because if there's a lot of like jut outs and crazy geometry then you want to have more holding tabs for less vibration of those sections of that part i made this table with a lazy susan but then you've you've improved it you actually put a plexiglass shield on top and the vacuum so like 90 percent of chips and dust get sucked into the vacuum yeah not only that but the the Plexiglass does not allow you to to get your fingers close to the routing bed. Mm -hmm. At one point, it just becomes really really hard for you to get your fingers in there. So and we have a brush that. actually around that the crescent portion where the wood is. We have a brush, right? That's a brush. It's a brush in there. Uh -huh. Yeah, correct. So you can pass material through that. And what are you doing here? It looks like you're doing the top. You're cleaning up the top portion. Yeah, sometimes I do that. I do that. I don't know why. I just like to have a um, a um, very clean finish. I'm riding the holding tabs, and that gives me a really clean edge. And then I flip it, and I use that for my advantage to be able to get the other, the top side, if you will. So you're getting the strip brush. So we're getting the strip brush to be able to cut a portion of it. And as you can see, we get it on roll. Yeah, this strip brush is used in lots of applications. And what you've probably seen it in uh, escalators. Look up, and whenever you're on an escalator, look at the bottom, and you'll see a strip brush just like this. So we're doing a dry fitting just to be able to get the the right um, length, and also be able to check whether the brush or the pocket that we did within the with the CNC was done correctly. Yeah, this is actually the hardest part, isn't it? It's tough to get that strip brush in that groove. We don't want to go too loose where the strip. The strip brush doesn't stand on edge very well, but you do also don't want to go too tight where you can't get the strip brush in. So there's a, a balance there. We use what kind of glue do we use? We use hot glue, right? Mm -hmm. To keep it in there. And we've never had a problem with using hot glue and having that strip brush stay in there. Yeah, we have wooden dust shoes and we 
we stick this uh, strip brush into wood as well, same in the same fashion. So we, as soon as we get the the measurement correctly, then we cut it. I ty I typically cut it a little bit longer, just a tap, maybe uh, one eighth of an inch longer. So then that gives me a little bit of a play. And once I get the right measurement, then I trim that off. And then once I get the drive fitting all correctly, then I bring the hot glue. I think the hot glue should be getting warmer. And, uh, you know, I typically do that. Plug in the hot glue. So by the time I'm doing this, uh, the hot glue gun is getting warm. And by the time I'm finishing, this is ready to go. I didn't do you any favors by making those uh, those circles tight, did I? Circles? What do you mean? Yeah, the curves of the where you have to put it in. Because you have to turn that strip brush pretty aggressively. Yeah, the, it. yeah. The, the 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 problem that could happen is when you have um, not essentially the curves, but when you have a curve against another curve. Okay, so you have a curve outside curve, then you yeah. curve in. Yeah, that's the difficult okay. portion of it. So we need to straighten those out, maybe. Well, I think we did that. We had this discussion before. Yeah, and we had to change it because <laughs> it was just a pain. Yeah, maybe I should maybe I should go back to making straight, making it more like an oval of different uh, diameter. And uh, you know, there's uh, this uh, the right way, and there's uh, Patrick's way, <laughs> <laughs> and there's Juan, Juan's way as well. Is that the right way? <laughs> no, there's the right way, Patrick's way, and Juan's way. Make the I had a hard time um, fitting the brush into the gap uh, because of the the brush is not completely uniform at, at every single. Uh, on each side, it has a little bit of a residue from uh, one day. Uh, and when they molded it. When they mold the... Yeah, it's called flash. So, there's a little bit of flash on the edges. Yeah, so that was that's one of the problems that I had with this specific brush. And it just kept happening on one side. So there's a peek into our process of making the acrylic dust shoe for the Fabricator Pro CNC router. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like the video and subscribe and make sure to press that notifications button as well so you can see when we put out new videos. Thank you for watching.